Sit down, strap in, listen up. It's time for the Wild Ones podcast. It's episode 38. It's the show where we chat about bike stuff. I'm Jimmy. This is Emily. That's Nick, the bike mechanic. I'm feeling good. You are feeling good. It's episode 35, not 38, but you are feeling good. Did I say 38? You did, yeah. (laughs) Do I need to redo that? (laughs) No, no, it's fine. Let's keep going. We're going to go with it. You're on a roll, I feel. Right, so I've been watching a lot of Gladiators (laughs) this week and I am fired up. What do you mean you've been watching a lot of Gladiators? Have you just been watching the movie over and over and over? No, not the movie. The re rehashed, relaunched TV show where very large humans in very small amounts of clothes, Lycra, like we all like to wear, uh, beat up members of the public. <laughs> do you think you would be a good gladiator, Jimmy? I don't necessarily think I'd be a good gladiator, but I would love to go on the show. What would your gladiator name be? My gladiator name? Um... Jimmy. I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. Uh, <laughs> for, for those who don't know, it was, it's like a reboot of an 80s, 90s? 90s, I think. TV yeah, show. 90s, and the gladiators it? all have very impressive names like Giant, Rhino, Wolf, Goliath, <laughs> Platinum. I don't know. Is this like a, a British thing, though? Like, did they, did they have this in South well, Africa? Well, in South Africa, I think, but I, I don't think I really watched it when I was a kid. It must have been like one of those global shows. I reckon everywhere had it. Potentially, yeah. Well, what would your gladiator name be? Uh, my gladiator name would be... I'm still just stuck with Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that Nick's would have to be Titanium. <laughs> <laughs> He is, he is obsessed with titanium. I, I like that. That's very good. That's very good. I was waiting to see what you come up with. Yeah. <laughs> Have you got one for me? In which case yours could be steel or... I do like steel, but... Steel is good, but then titanium, is, it's, a bit too, it's a bit too obvious. Maybe, I think ox would be a good fit one for you. Ox? Ox. It's like short and stocky. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Ox. <laughs> Spartacus. I would call you Spartacus. <laughs> what's Emily? What's your? Well, I don't internet? know. I'm not very, I can't be very objective with it. If we're really, it would be, have to be wimp. But, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe it could be like a bluff, although it would actually be a double bluff because I am actually a wimp. I would like to be the referee. Three, two, one. Exactly. <laughs> but the, the new ref is also from the Northeast as well, we found out. As well as you. As well as me. So we could, well. just, we could swap out. What, you and the ref? Yeah. I think we should do a gladiators with all of us. Get Chris Hall up here as well. Francis back. Well, and Chris, we just Chris all, is the walrus. And we all just fight it out. Yeah. Chris and, I'll take Chris on my side. You take Francis. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's get into some news. So SRAM's back in the headlines this week over a safety recall they've issued on loose brake levers. They've admitted there's an issue with the faulty clamp inside the brake lever hood on some of their products. It appears the faulty bolts aren't tightening properly, and SRAM admits there's a risk that the levers could move, causing a rider to crash. SRAM says the recall affects all 12-speed ETAP, Axis, Red, Force, Rival, and Apex shift brake levers produced before the 1st of July 2023. They say this only affects aftermarket products and that bikes assembled by a qualified mechanic are not affected. However, we've already seen a couple of comments online from people saying they've had this issue with levers installed by a mechanic. Customers have been warned to stop using the recalled brake levers immediately and inspect them even for tightness. The company has asked concerned customers to check the tightness of their brakes, sharing a guide and video tutorial on Instagram, and we're going to share a link to anyone listening on our video slash podcast so you can check if it affects you. I don't think this is a real recall at all. What does that mean? I mean, it's literally a recall. It is a recall, but it's not in the sense of, if we take, for instance, the last one, Shimano's crank sets were cracking. These, there's nothing wrong with the bolts. There's just too much Loctite on there. So when you tighten it up, if you're using a torque wrench, you're going to get a false false torque reading. It's like wet talking and dry talking. So that um, sounds like a fault to me. Yeah, that is a problem. It is, but what I mean is... It's not going to snap, snap, but that's still a fault. But generally speaking, different handlebars are different. So in the bike shop, we, we you use torque as an idea of what the maximum is. But you, you, in essence, really, you have to tighten the levers up and then slight, apply a slight bit of pressure to see if they move or don't move. You don't want them too tight because if they're too tight, uh, you can crack the bars or if you crash, your lever's going to break. So I actually, on my own bike, make my lever slightly looser just so that in case, if I have a crash, they move. So it's a whole thing of a competent mechanic would tighten it up and just feel, put a bit of pressure, okay, they're moving or they're not moving, and then based off that, decide if it's tight enough. So the other thing is, 
I know, speaking to Shran before, um, all you'd have to do is loosen the bolt, tighten it, loosen, tighten it about three times, and that will just wear off the excess Loctite, and that's your problem fixed. So you don't really need new bolts. SRAM has made them available. They've told us they've, they are there if anybody is insistent that they want them, um, but it's not a, you don't need them, if that makes sense. For us in the shop, I'll never order the bolts, and we will just fix a problem by loosening and tightening them. I guess that's why they're saying if it was installed by a qualified mechanic, you're probably not going to have a problem because yeah. they're going to understand that, that the that, torque yeah, reading to, isn't yeah. matching what's happening. And that's not just RAM, that's, that's all levers. Um, the other thing is that, um, why are they saying it's for aftermarket? I think this is aimed at people that have gone on the internet or at a shop and bought a set of levers in a box and walked away if they tried to fit it themselves at home. That's what it's actually aimed for. Yeah. Which is, which is which is legitimate. Fine. Perfect, I guess yeah, you yeah. have to you have to deal with these but it's kind good. of things. I think they're trying to get ahead of the so that it's not a problem. Obviously, you don't want your levers to slip. But yeah. Where where I disagree with you is if something has a torque rating and you fix it to that torque rating and it isn't attached to the bar with the torque rating that you fixed it to, then there is a fault with it. But, but the whole torque rating thing is a massive farce, really, if you think about it. So. The big thing is torque ratings are thrown out by manufacturers all over the place. Some manufacturers don't actually give you torque ratings, but there's a difference. So if, if you're a mechanic and there's a torque rating on a bolt for a set amount, but a mechanic then takes that bolt and greases it, that torque rating changes completely. Um, so it, it's a bit of a, it's a guideline. It's not actually a, a set truth. So you need to see some manufacturer will tell you whether it's wet torquing or dry torquing, whether it needs lube or does need lube, because all of that changes. Loctite completely changes the torque, because it'll get to that max torque much quicker than if it was a greased bolt. Bear in mind, we're not talking about mechanics now. We're talking about members of the public. No, no, but that's what I mean. This, but this is th this is a problem. So it's one of those things of you need to take everything with a pinch of salt. It doesn't work. It's not an exact science. It, well, it is technically an exact science, but the cycling industry is all over the place, and it's not giving you the exact things. I, th I, I think what I'm getting from what you're saying is just because a torque rating says seven newton meters you still have to check stuff yeah because you, you'll get loads of seat bolts seat posts slip and you'll you'll read the torque rating seven newton meters you talk of seven newton slips you ring the manufacturer you know what they tell you i'll try eight or nine newton meters well is it seven or is it eight or nine it's more of a dark art than this whole wheel building thing that people say is a dark art <laughs> it's just one of those that it comes with a bit of experience. You'll just realize everybody will still get it wrong sometimes, but it is well, just... Well, yeah, yeah, that's ultimately why they're yeah, yeah. working on the basis of if a mechanic's installed it, they should have yeah. the experience and expertise to be able to work out what's going on. Yes, and your levers aren't going to just slip off the handlebars and be gone. It's literally going to be, it'll slide down half a centimeter or so if it was to lose. Which but, yeah, can cause generally. a crash. I was about to say, we, we shouldn't can, yeah, underplay yeah, this yeah. because SRAM, SRAM themselves are saying, stop using the levers, they might cause a crash. It's good that they're taking responsibility for it as they should. I wonder whether uh, the crank gate thing that happened with Shimano is prob it's probably one of the driving forces behind why they're getting in front of this early. They're going, they're making sure that they're yeah, yeah. resolving it, which they should. Because crank gate was, uh, was denied for months and months or for years. Years, yeah. Next, it turns out the Tour of Britain and the Women's Tour will happen in 2024 after all. So British Cycling has stepped in and taken over both the Tour of Britain and the Women's Tour. They said the Men's Tour will take place in its regular September slot. They're going to ensure the Women's Race can take place this June too, but the short time frame means that the Women's Race may need to be shorter than originally planned. So it's great that the races are going to happen. Uh, obviously, it's, I'm sure, very disappointing for many people, including the people racing in the Women's Tour, that it's going to be made shorter, perhaps, um, but it's good that it is still alive. I, I think it'll be a shame if it's shorter because surely they don't have to restart the planning. They'll be getting, I mean, the previous owners of the race must have done some planning and there must be some format they can set in and just carry on with. We're in redundancy. So, I mean, I, I might be completely wrong, but I'm just saying, like, I hope, I just don't understand how, it's, it's not a thing of you're starting new, fresh. It's things carry on. 
I guess it's probably to do with like road closures and that kind of thing. With oh yeah, like there's probably minimum periods of time that they have to announce stuff and make public information available of road closures. And yeah, stuff. it's what five months. So perhaps to talking to councils and getting because yeah, fair enough, they might have done the planning, but then if you say actually it's not happening anymore, then people do other things, don't they? So perhaps it's a getting councils on board and a road closure thing, but that is pure speculation. It's good to see uh, it back yes, though, isn't all, it? Yeah, yeah it, could, it could even be like a financial thing. Like it's going to take yeah. a while for the money to move across and stuff costs money, you know, at the end of the day. But yeah, it's it's great that it's it's happening. Bravo, bit of cycling. <laughs> They're the heroes of the hour. Well, <laughs> now on to our big question. Do us men do enough to look after our health? So if you listen to this podcast, you probably enjoy exercising or at least tolerate it. And you're probably male. There's loads of information out there about the benefits of a healthy diet and exercise, and we all know cycling is good for our health in loads of ways. However, there's also so many studies that show that men are much less likely to get medical help when something's wrong. In fact, one study found that men are 50% less likely to seek medical attention than women. Another revealed that nearly two-thirds of men said that they avoid going to the doctor as long as possible, 37% 37% said that they had withheld information from their doctor in the past, spe- specifically because they weren't ready to deal with the potential diagnosis. Experts say that this is an ongoing issue that keeps doctors from detecting and treating life-threatening issues early. Well, I think I'm terrible for this. I haven't been to a GP for anything other than, well, I don't know if I can say it, but my, my snip. Mm-hmm. I've not been to a doctor in, since 2014. And that's with broken bones and ribs. I just wait until I've got a customer that comes to the shop that is a got some medical background and just ask, is this serious enough to go to the hospital or not? And generally they just say it'll heal by itself. When I put an axe through my toe, uh, Andy helped me by taping it up and gluing it and said it was just going to fix itself. So, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> to be fair, I have to say I am actually the same as well. I would rather... Um, avoid going as well mainly because i just decide that oh it'll probably be fine which is definitely not a good attitude to have um but yeah there's there's so much research that shows that statistically this is it's more likely to be guys who do this um there was a new study that came out this week actually talking about how cycling could help reduce the risk of prostate cancer by up to 35 percent Prostate cancer is actually the most common cancer in men. It affects around one in eight. And if you're a man over 50, you're at higher risk. You're at even higher risk if you're a black man or if your family has a history of prostate cancer. So we thought it would be a good idea to mention the symptoms and how you can get tested. So symptoms include needing to pee more frequently, often during the night, needing to rush to the toilet, difficulty in starting to pee, straining or taking a long time to pee, weak flow, feeling like your bladder has not emptied fully or blood in the urine or semen. These symptoms do not always mean that you have prostate cancer, but if you're worried, you should speak to a doctor because the earlier the detection, the higher chance of survival. Um, You can also get a thing in this country, and I'm sure it's available in other countries, called PSA testing. So if you're over 50 and you live in the UK, you can ask your GP for regular PSA tests. And this is a blood test. It's called a prostate-specific antigen test. A prostate-specific antigen test, which may help detect for early prostate cancer. And my dad actually had one of these and it saved his life. Uh, So he had absolutely no symptoms at all but he had started to just generally lose muscle mass. Um, So my mum sort of suggested maybe you should get some HRT. So HRT is really common for women, hormone hormone replacement therapy. And especially when you're going through menopause, it's something that some women choose to get, but you can also get it as a guy as well. And it's a prescribed testosterone gel. But to get that, you have to have regular testosterone monitoring and and PSA tests. So as part of that, when he was getting his uh, testosterone gel, they were doing PSA tests. And his went from normal to basically life-threatening in like four months. And it was detected in November 2015. And he had surgery in 2016 and he's still alive. And to be honest, he probably wouldn't be had it not been for PSA testing. So guys, if you're over 50, get a PSA test. It's a blood test. Um, and you can also, if you are worried about any of the symptom mentioned, you can go and have exams as well. And you should. It, al- it almost feels like one in eight men is a low. It, I, I feel like the statistic would be higher than that because mm. I don't know 
loads of people that have been impacted by cancer, but I do know multiple people that have been affected by prostate, prostate cancer. Prostate cancer. Yeah, me too, actually. Yeah. That's why I left the army. Why? So they thought I had prostate cancer. Yeah. Because of all the symptoms. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, bizarrely, just after my Iron Man, that I ran, uh, they did a test and they thought it's from, because I was riding back in the day. I don't know if it's directly from that, but they think it's pure speculation. But my saddle without a cutout groove from years of riding and how I was riding and things I was doing, uh, I had crushed my urethra. Mm. So it started de- developing. So then all the symptoms of struggling to pee and all these things was a big thing. Right. So I had my surgery scheduled. Uh, after they did the PSA test and they said it's too low, they don't think it's prostate cancer, but they're going to have to keep checking because my family's got a really bad history of um, cancer. Yeah. Like everybody in the family's had something. So I had my surgery too quick after that Iron Man and flip flops. <laughs> um, well, once again, this is what the doctor said afterwards. And while the surgery was happening to fix my urethra, uh, I got an infection. And then I was in and out of hospital for the next six months with being ill. And then I got medically discharged because of that. And ever since, I've never been, never been back to a doctor. Really? <laughs> yeah, which is, I know it's not a good... I'm, I'm probably gone the other way, like somebody that's had all the things, yeah. Uh, so now I have to get regularly tested just to make sure that obviously all these PSA test the levels are right. Yeah. But. It's good to know though, isn't it? Like I always think, okay, from a women's perspective, cervical cancer and breast cancer and... In this country, on the NHS, women are regularly screened for both cervical cancer and breast cancer. You have a mammogram, which is a scan of your breasts, and you have a surgical smear, which is um, a thing goes up inside you and they take a swab and then they test the cells from it. And I get a letter every three years. If you're more high risk, it can be every year, whatever. Um, And that's just like a screening process as standard. And there was a lot of campaigning to bring the age of that lower. And it now starts from something like 25 and it's interesting that they're, they're female specific, very high rate cancers and they're screening and there's nothing equivalent for guys. Maybe we should start a campaign. Yeah, I think it needs to be campaign. But, you know, if guys don't want this to happen, then I can see why it hasn't been campaigned against. But you know, I, I think you're right. I think, I mean, if I got a letter through the door saying, come in, you know, we'll schedule you for this. Like I go to the dentist every six months. It's yeah. not because I remember. It's just because the dentist sends me a letter every six months where you've got an appointment on this day. I'm just going to show up obediently and pay him mm-hmm. money to tell me everything's fine. Yep. So, yeah, I think it'll be good. Because like say, I say, I, I don't, I think I don't go to the doctor because I don't restrain on the NHS yep. or cause any, like take up someone's time. But if they just book you the appointments and tell you it's there, then essentially it's like, well, then I'll go because it's there. They've they've decided to invite me in. Um, I should probably go. Mm-hmm. Get this test done. Do it, please. Yeah, do it. <laughs> uh, whilst we're on the subject of men's health, I think we should talk about a couple of other things. Mm-hmm. An obvious one is testicular cancer. Do you check your nuts? Uh, so testicular cancer is one of the most common causes of cancer in young people, but it is treated with a high success rate, which is great. Symptoms can include a swelling or lump or heavy feeling in your testicles. Testicular cancer is usually diagnosed with blood tests, ultrasound ultrasound scan, and a CT or MRI scan. I remember when I was young-ish, I, it was actually when I was living in London with Lewis, and I thought I might have... I, I basically, I, I convinced myself I was going to die, and I remember being too scared to tell anyone about it. And then eventually I told my flatmate Lewis, and he was like, just go and get it checked. So then I remember being probably like 25 or something or other and a weird man in a hospital fondling my nuts. And I was just, cause I had an ultrasound scan and I was like, this is, <laughs> this is an interesting experience getting uh, lubricants put on my, my balls with by a man. <laughs> but th- thankfully it was fine. <laughs> it sounds really horrible, but I think you just kind of like, it's in a medical situation. I mean, the amount of people yeah. that had their fingers up my, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> After and the army, I, I think I counted like 14 different people in like the space of one month. This this is it. Like it is embarrassing. Obviously, I am not a guy. However, I routinely have checkups as, you know, a letter gets sent to me and I go and do it. There's a lot of conversation around women's health. You know, I think in the past women have been taught to be very, very um, embarrassed of their bodily bits. And there's been a huge movement to get women talking about their bits. And I don't think that 
it's starting to happen more for men, but I think almost the women's movement of that has come along far more than the guys. Mm. And it is embarrassing having a person you don't know do stuff to your private parts, but your life is too important to be embarrassed about that. And, you know, you get it done and then, you know, you don't have to worry for a little bit, but you can't bury well, your head in the sand. Yeah, if you leave it too long, like say 14 people in less than a month, you know, it could have just been one for did it earlier. Trigger warning for this next section, we are going to be talking about mental health and suicide. So three out of four suicides are men. It's the biggest killer globally for boys and men aged between 15 and 45. That like, is an outstanding stat, isn't it? That, that is just wild. Like the biggest global killer for 15 to 45 year olds. It's really sad, isn't it? So in 2017, 91% of middle-aged men who died by suicide were in touch or had been in contact with the healthcare system to ask for support. And I, I think this makes me think of two things. One, I know for a fact the system fails people from someone that we know that used to be in the cycling scene that ended up killing herself. She was completely failed by the system. Mm. Um, but this also perhaps taps into what we're talking about here in general is 90, 91% of middle-aged men who did kill themselves were in contact with the healthcare system. Were they perhaps not actually telling, the, were they not tell, talking enough? Were they not telling the truth? Were they going, I, I don't feel great. Whereas actually what was happening was much more severe than that. So if you are going to go to the doctors, if you have got the confidence and you have got to the point that you are able to do that, just be honest, you know, they're not going to look at you weirdly or, or think down upon you. Tell them the truth. Tell them everything. Don't hold back because they are the people that are going to be able to help you. Also, I mean, this seems like a very doom and gloom section, but the message you're trying to get across is early detection has a much higher success rate. And that's true of these cancers, but I also think it's true of mental health. Don't let yourself get so bad that it feels beyond repair. You know what I mean? I again, I think that in society, it's much more accepted for, I'm a person who hides my feelings, but I know if I do cry, I'm probably not going to be laughed at. And I, I think that those things still exist for men with other men. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So me, Nick... One of our mates, Scott, tattoo, tattoo artist Scott, who I love, and your dad, Ivor. I know Mark. And Mark Brimacom, the photo guy. We, I actually started a alternative to going to a pub on a Friday because none of us really drink. Some, some of us, some of that group don't drink at all. I like, we're not big drinkers. We're not the kind of people which go down the pub, have a couple of beers and just chat about stuff. So I was like, well, what other alternatives are there? I was like, well, driving range. Like it's, it's a skill-based thing, which is macho. Anyone can do it. It's not actually about the golf. Uh, so we go a couple of times a month uh, and it's just an excuse to kind of chat about stuff that's not work. And I'm very, I, like, I, I think it's a really good thing having a group of males, having a space that they can just kind of talk about anything. And I, I push that and I, and I encourage that. And when inevitably Nick starts talking about work, I tell him to shut up because it's not about work. He can talk about like challenges and issues that are bothering him, but I don't want to know about the latest SRAM group set <laughs> when, when I'm relaxing on, an, on a Friday are evening. Are you trying to tell me that we are not going to the PJ tour? Because that's the only reason I'm showing up for this every <laughs> two weeks. No. Well, you can. You can with the other guys, but I'm not interested. So a friend of mine as well, Paul Regan in South Wales. He's a mental health nurse in the NHS in South Wales. Uh, he was actually the front man in the band I used to be in when I was young. He started a not-for-profit called Stand Up Wales, or Stand Tall Wales. And the whole principle of that is it's eight-week courses for anyone. It's free of charge. And in that eight weeks, you go once a week. Uh, it's a group of guys that some of them may know each other. A lot of them don't know each other. And they do an hour of weightlifting with a qualified weightlifting coach and then following that they then do a session where they talk about you know he, he'll he'll run courses on how to deal with stress how to do this how to do that so it's essentially an eight-week course to bring a group of guys together to give them something to bond around which is weightlifting and also to have a safe space to talk and they're finding that off the back of those courses 
a lot of these groups are then still staying together. They mm. form in WhatsApp groups, Facebook groups, and still having then this space to be able to talk about stuff. And I think that is one of the things that men do rubbish and women do better. And I, and I act, I'm actively trying to encourage more people to create spaces that are not about being like, let's go watch the football and neck some beers and eat some pies. Let's actually kind of go like, how have you been this week? You mm -hmm. know? Fine. Well, well do actually, that tell as, me more about that. You can do that as well while you're eating pies and watching football. But yeah, the... well, but but the environment of that is a macho environment. Yeah, but it's, uh, so I'm being South African and Afrikaans kind of like talking about feelings seems like the biggest no, no, no ever. Like I just wouldn't do it. Yeah, but how but, much more do you do it now that you, yes, not, but since I knowing think, me than you, you know what when I, think I met it is? you? Because it's just growing up, it's like the stigma, so it's just not done. Mm -hmm. kind of thing you just get on with it kind mm -hmm. of every single day just get on with it which i know is wrong but like obviously in my dna it's like that's just how it's done chris hall i think is one that's changed it for me yeah because he's like very open and you think like I i've sat in like the cafe before and listened to like guys talking about stuff and i just think like my brain just kind of can't seem to get around it but then watching chris more and more do it and like the amount of people following support kind of shows that it isn't actually, I'm wrong, if that makes sense. And that kind of thing is, nobody's going to think, yeah, I don't, know how, well, I don't know how to explain it better. But yeah, Chris is a really good example of like, I'm, he's I'm glad so you brought, open to talk, yeah. I'm glad you brought him up because I was going to reference him in this as well because he's, it's good to see how things have changed because even six, seven years ago, there are various, like Chris is very comfortable showing his emotions and he does some really epic stuff and gets emotional and cries, which is perfectly fine. And I remember very early on when we were doing some of these massive challenges, this is me and Emily being involved with Chris in some of his challenges in whatever capacity. And I remember he used to get haters where people would like call him a wuss and call him soft because he was like showing his emotion. And what I love about Chris is he's doubled down on it. Well, not doubled down on it, but he's he's he hasn't gone like, oh God, yeah, people people are reacting just horribly to me. He's yeah, gonna yeah. be like, well, I don't I don't care. I'm gonna keep demonstrating that you can show emotion. But he's got a true following as well. So you can see that there's loads of people supporting. It's like mm -hmm. it's one of those. Yeah, yeah. He's he's amazing. He's uh, absolutely I mean, amazing. I'm, I would be the first to say when I before I'd met Chris and seen the stuff online, I'd be like, I wouldn't get on with him because it's just completely different to my mindset. But I love Chris. I mean, we're doing Badlands together this year. Well, yeah, you go we'll ride with him then yeah. and you realize he's absolutely double yeah. hard. Yeah, this Which is, is like, <laughs> it is a massive U-turn. So just kind of like, I think people's minds need to be open to stuff. I think you, you get preconditioned into a thing and it doesn't mean you're right. Kind of be open to try stuff. And that can be detrimental to you yeah, yeah. if you're going through a mental health crisis. If you're not, I think that kind of just get on with it you're affecting your peers yeah. at the end of the day. Like you can choose to be, I don't get this. It's uncomfortable. It's too woke for me, whatever. But it's the biggest killer of boys and men between 50, 15 and 45. People in your peer group or in your sort of outer circle will be struggling and it's attitudes like just get on with it that are potentially very, very harmful, really. Mm-hmm. We should also say, if you feel like you are struggling, then um, please, please get help, seek support. The Samaritans are a really good charity, mind.org.uk. Movember as well is a really good one. They they look into prostate cancer, testicular cancer, mental health. Also speak to your doctor. And at the absolute worst case scenario, even if you're too scared to do any of the bigger steps, speak to your family and close friends. And they, as happened, has, as has happened with me, various points in my life, they will give you that confidence and support to be able to have those conversations, which you probably think are going to be horrible and the worst things ever, but they're just not, you know, like I, I've had some lows and the most significant, some of the most significant parts of my life are making the changes that have got me past something which I thought was going to be horrible. Yes, don't think that you just have to get on with it. Okay, so time for another round of overrated or underrated. I'm going to read out a list of things and you're going to tell me if they're overrated or underrated. So first up, we have a suggestion by Luke and he has titled it Content Creators Slash Cycling Influencers. <laughs> he says, 
I follow a few of them, such as yourselves, Keep Smiling Adventures, some of Lawrence's stuff, and some of Trey's fellow. I find the content put out to be useful, inspiring, and I get a genuine feeling that they are thankful to be lucky enough to earn a living doing what they are doing. It gets me excited to ride my bike and plan my next adventure. Then I flick over to Instagram, which is saturated with hundreds of other content creators posting videos and them getting dressed to go out for a perfect ride in perfect weather with perfect kit whilst brewing an expensive coffee. It instantly turns me off of everything I like about cycling. I think these sort of images and outlets are hugely jam- damaging to people looking to get into cycling. It feels like it almost makes cycling more elitist than it already is. I'd be interested to know what your thoughts of this kind of cycling for likes culture is and may just be an age thing, but I just don't get social media anymore. It's difficult for me because it's like, I hate that word influencer. Yeah. Now doing more stuff with you guys and France is sticking his camera in my face every few days in the bike shop. It's like, hey, loads of people coming in, you're an influencer. And I, I, to my core, I hate it. But then do you think about like, we're selling bikes and we, we're kind of influencing people to buy stuff or to do things. So yes. But it's it's a difficult one because like I agree with him. I mean, I just unfollow loads of people now that if, if they're doing stuff where I just kind of think that's not for me or learn, I just kind of and back in the day I used to kind of hate on it. Where now it's more just just unfollow, Let it go. don't watch I, it. Yeah, I don't um, understand why people are so aggressively against influencers because you can just not look. I know, but it, I get it. But it's it's the term that's caused a problem, if that makes sense. So it is a thing of like, and they are, don't get me wrong, there's loads of people on there that I think what they're doing, like it annoys me massively, but it's taken me quite a while. I stopped looking now because you guys are telling me to just stop looking, but I, I get that it's a problem. Um, on the kit thing and perfect weather, it's just England where the weather is, well, it's not just England, but England where the weather's terrible. Back home in Strafi, I, I rode in perfect weather every day. So I miss that. You're saying some I people sh- just have better lives. Yeah, I should just move back. <laughs> I do think Instagram is not real. Yeah, but it's uh, short form as well. Yeah, and uh, we're all we're all programmed, whether we consider ourselves influencers or not. Um, we are all programmed to show our best selves online. It's like a first date. You show your best self and you don't put in the, not even the bad bits, but just the boring bits. Most people's lives are incredibly mundane, I think. Back to Chris Hall. Chris Hall's a good example because he will... He takes people through his his lows as well as his ups. Yeah, he's he's really good. He's he's a really good influencer, if you want to call him that, because yeah, it's he's good. he's honest. But you're not getting a whole. You're not getting the entirety of anyone's no, no. life ever, because there's loads of, of mundane course. parts that are just boring as well. And if you're sat at home going, "My life is so boring," and you're seeing people riding in amazing places all the time, there's a there's a disconnect and a jealousy and a bugger off kind of thing. And I guess we have to acknowledge that some people well, probably a lot of people are going to see us as being that. Although most most of what we do is just sit in this this room and talk about cycling rather than cycling. But do you, I wonder often, like with Francis, whether that is, because the channel's done well, whether that is purely based on, when you do Instagram, so, I mean, I've posted, what, like a hundred times ever on Instagram, terrible for it. Instagram, like you say, it is true what uh, Luke, is it Luke over here saying where it's, but people just post their like perfect lives, not everything. Where I think on YouTube generally with the vlog, the longer ones like France used to post quite often, it's like there's quite a lot of stuff that he's doing. You couldn't just It's relatability, yeah. isn't it? You're always gonna have more relatability when you're yeah. vlogging your life every single day versus putting up a picture. A, a picture doesn't actually photo, say anything. Yeah. I think not even part of the problem, but I think one of the reasons that people get their backs up about this space is influencer has become a style of content which it was never meant to be it's not meant to be a style of content it's meant the whole function of it from a marketing perspective is identifying individuals that have an influential following uh as social media grew so historically like nick's a great example of it he owns a bike shop which have customers he has influence because he can say to them you should buy these products because i think they're great or because i'm being paid to to sell these products for whatever reason it doesn't matter the point is you have influence over people buying people that run cycling clubs probably have influence over the the members of that club the thing with social media is you all of a sudden had people which had followings of random people from all over the world and marketeers or marketers wanted to look for people that had an element of influence but the the 
the thing that's got really weird is that it's now a style of content. It is. So how many cycling YouTubers are there that create vlogs that just because I don't even know why, just because it it's they want to be. I don't even know how to explain it. You it's know? almost uh, the the OG influencers have influenced people into becoming influencers or making influencer style content. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's like meta, isn't it? My advice to anyone listening to this that is a content creator slash cycling influencer or wants to be one is don't look at stuff and go, oh, they're wearing this thing and they've got this camera and they're doing it in this style and they're using this kind of music and therefore I'll do that. Look at it, learn how to make good video, learn how to make film, tell your story, tell the stuff that you want to tell. Don't go bikepacking, vlogging a bikepacking trip is going to make me an influencer and make me loads of money. Like, well, no, it's it's boring to most people and, unless you have skill or a story or a method work out, look at it, uh, look about what is unique about you. What do you bring? Why would someone want to give a shit about you rather than anyone else? Don't just do stuff just for the sake of it. Also to, to non-influent, regular people, if you dislike content creators slash influencers, you, your viewership, your attention is like your currency. So just don't give them your currency. You know, you're, for a content creator influencer, you are made or broken on your engagement, your likes, your views, whatever it is. So if you don't like them, don't watch them. Scroll on. I, I recently took myself off Instagram. I'm technically still on there, but I'm not I'm not looking at it. I don't really post. I don't really do anything. You're not on Instagram anymore. I don't. You're going to have a lot of reels when you log in next then. Oh, he always, send, <laughs> he always sends me stuff. It's so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> he just follows you at the thousands I send him every day. Yeah. I only use Instagram for reels. I'm obsessed. I don't even look at um, yours anymore. But I'm not, po- <laughs> what I'm saying is I'm not actively posting and yeah. I'm not really actively looking at people on there either because I, I, don't, just, I just don't uh, care. And all for the keyboard warriors out there, just remember your negative comments actually makes these people more money because... It's true. That's it's, why some people are professional agitators yeah. for a living. Ugh. That That is the reason I don't use social media as much as I used to. Yeah. But literally, like, you can grow a YouTube channel just on hating on other people because it, you know, gets like Whatever gets likes and engagement and comments works. <laughs> what are we saying? Overrated or underrated? I think at the moment, the majority is overrated. Yeah, you can't say underrated. They're everywhere. I'm going to say underrated because they have changed so many people's lives. And that doesn't that doesn't mean all of them. That doesn't mean even the majority. The point is there are cycling influencers out there. How many people listen to this have been influenced by Francis's adventures over the years? The stuff that Francis has done. How many people have learnt from videos that Francis has made in the past? Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions, and therefore underrated because they do make people's lives better. There's just a lot of rubbish ones out there. It's a shame he's gone forever now. Like, where has he been? We haven't seen him once this year. He will return next week. Right, so we have another suggestion from Luke, and this one potentially is sick. Uh, Vinted for cycling kit. So also suggested by Luke, who says, I think it's massively underrated, have had some absolute bargains on there, all with the bonus of being more sustainable. I've not personally used Vinted before because I don't have any clothes that are worth selling because all of my stuff is junk. Um, but that th- I bet there's some. I bet there is some absolute bargains on there, and I bet you can get some really cool stuff. So maybe that's something worth checking. If you're looking, if you buy secondhand kit, I know a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people we know do buy kit on eBay secondhand. Maybe check out Vinted because you might get yourself a, bar- a banger of a deal. I'm about to list like my entire wardrobe on there. Are you? <laughs> I've just got so much stuff that I never wear. Like, I'm really boring when it comes to clothes. Have you been on Vinted before? Uh, Lauren's on it. Yeah. So I've been watching her thing. I've been trying to do stuff on eBay a little bit, which is good, but I want to try Vinted out because it's more clothing specific. It is more clothes. Uh, so I have sold and bought things, not of the cycling variety, on Vinted. And it is good. It, I mean, it's no different, I guess, from eBay other than it's clothing specific. And what I have found specifically is if you have branded stuff, um, goes for a decent price i've I've spent my entire life specifically not buying branded clothing and therefore I, all of my wardrobe has no value underrated vinted underrated yeah definitely underrated 
Next on the list is, and this is one for you to talk about, Nick, ceramic bearings. I've never used ceramic bearings. I am definitely not the target uh, customer for ceramic bearings because I would never buy them. So we, you and I were talking this morning about a sustainable bike, belt drives and all these things. You want to build some, something that's going to last and not be as wasteful. And yep. I think for that topic, ceramic is massively underrated. Uh, if you're buying it for speed, I don't know what actually everybody is marketing it at, it's overrated because it doesn't offer that much speed. I mean, full disclosure, I'm sponsored by Enduro Bearings, but it's not because, I'm not saying this because I'm just ceramic in general. The issue is that they all claim these speeds and things like that. But uh, Matt from Enduro has done some tests where they've, from a, a basic normal bottom bracket to a full ceramic top of the range. Can I, can I ask you a question first before you dig yeah. into the detail of this? Endura, do they do ceramic bearings? Yes, they do. Do they do non-ceramic bearings? Yes. Do they do cheap bearings? Yes. Do they do expensive bearings? Yes. Very okay, expensive. So, so essentially they're the whole of market. They do everything, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, 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 cool. So, but the whole thing about it is that ceramic doesn't give you the speed. A full ceramic bearing versus like a normal basic Shimano bottom bracket is only gonna give you about one watt. So what people are advertising and buying it for is for the wrong reason. One, one what though? That's the difference between winning or losing. I know. <laughs> that is the comment. Whenever there's a challenge on weight or aero, there will always be a comment where someone says, but that's the difference between first and second place. Okay, I know for you and me, <laughs> that's like doubling our FTP. But I mean, for, yeah. for your average cyclist that actually rides a bike, um, it's not going to make any difference. Um, yeah. So I wouldn't... If you buy ceramic bearings for durability, then that's great. But then you need to make sure the ceramic balls will never corrode, but you need to make sure the races that the bearings are set in, sat in is also made of a material that won't corrode. So once like again- Like ceramic? You can't do ceramic races effectively. I, would, I don't have the engineering know-how to explain this properly, but think of it as glass. Are, are there, so to do the shape, to do make a round ball out of glass is really easy because it's a spherical um, design, but to make the races out of it, there's a risk that they will explode. So once again, I've seen photos of where people have tried to do it, but at speed and with load, when it goes wrong, it goes horribly wrong. So, so no one sells, or at least to your knowledge, sells a ceramic bottom bracket where the race bearing ceramic. and the race are both ceramic. Um, I'm pretty sure there'd be some companies in the Far East that probably do it, but nobody's making one that is safe or that's reliable. But like the big brands that are out there, you're not, they don't? No. Right, okay, they don't cool. do it. Cool. But Enduro, for instance, they do a thing called XD15, which is nitrogen-infused stainless steel. It will never rust, and it's incredibly hard. So something like that, I've been riding my bike, just won't ever weigh out. So if you're buying, and I've not got it for speed, because I'm not fast. I've got it purely in there, so I don't have to wash my bike or look after it properly. Every time I've ever. talked to you about my bikes and bearings, you've said, we've got to get you some of these bearings because they've got a lifetime warranty. And to be fair, lifetime warranty is something which is proper cropping up more and more in cycling and it's i'd never really considered it before but it does influence me now it does it does like for example zips zip wheels yeah. and envy are they doing? they're well. too expensive yeah. in the first place mine but ultimately if i if i'm buying if i'm going to be buying stuff for a bike now i am looking at two things is it durable is it gonna last me forever and how sustainable is it and then when you start looking at things like l bearings that are designed to basically live forever, then that seems like a, 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 a good, corrosion a good buy. There's 90% of all bearings fail because of corrosion. People got all, corrosion is what kills bearings. So if you live somewhere really dry and warm and dry, sorry, not humid, don't buy ceramic bearings. Don't buy stainless steel. Just buy a basic bearing. Save your money because that'll last incredibly long. Um, if you live somewhere in wet weather, at least go for something that's stainless steel. Chris King, all these guys make really good stuff. Um, make sure it's a good grade of stainless steel and it'll just last much longer. But also be careful with lifetime warranties, not just on, on everything. It's a very loose term brands throw out there. So they'll say, for instance, uh, I'm going to use Canada as an example. They did on a while, there was lifetime warranty, uh, but it's the expected lifetime of the whatever product it is, the frame set. And that expected lifetime could be three years. Oh, whatever. it's lifetime, not yes, your lifetime. not your lifetime. Oh, That's right, okay. So you need to be careful on these things. <laughs> also, Ceramic Speed, for instance, they give you uh, lifetime warranties on the bearings, but there's a massive disclosure in there. If there's a single speck of rust in that bearing when it goes back to them and the races, your warranty is cancelled because you didn't look after it. Fact or speculation? 
Fact. So it's it's okay. essentially a it's a conditional lifetime warranty. Meaning yeah, you have course, to look yeah. after. You can't just go wild and zip. For instance, they technically speaking, the warranty on the wheels, the crash warranty, only counts if you're on the bike riding it. So if you put your bike at a cafe and somebody rides into it and breaks the wheel, technically speaking, Zip could just say, no, it's not a warranty. Or if the bike's on the car's roof and you've driven into a wall with it, it's, they don't have to warranty it. Yeah. But if you sat on the bike and you rode into a pothole or your mate rode into you while you sat in, on the bike, then the, obviously it's, it's a loose kind of term to give them extra clauses. Mm -hmm. On this XD15, though, it's an unconditional warranty. We've done some stupid things with it. I've taken the seals out of bearings and just let it run open. James has been running bottom bracket for a year with no seals or grease in it, just to see what happens. Because um, the seals were actually, the, the reason we took the seals out wasn't because of trying to get it dirty. The seals will cause more drag when they're dry than a, a ceramic bearing ever would give you an advantage of. I think something like 20 times slower, a dry seal than a wet seal. What's a dry seal and a wet seal? So if you're bearings on your bike has got seals in them. Yeah. If the seal dries out, so your grease is completely gone, that seal will, will have 20 times more drag than a wet seal. So if you're gonna run something like those bearings without any seals in them, or sorry, any grease in them, it's probably best to take the seals out as well. Why is James running the bearing without any grease in it? We, we want to test it. Oh, just to try James it. breaks everything. Just to try and trash I, it. I've not seen a single thing that James hasn't broken. Right. That kid ruins everything <laughs> we're testing warranties with him because it's literally zip uh, he's gone through three wheel sets from zip in one year uh, crashes that's not the wheels failing but that's just him hitting potholes or in races they he hit a brick with both wheels once um and they've been really good but yeah it's james is my my test dummy on <laughs> how things how long things last we've just found out a SRAM rival cassette on his bike uh 13 and a half thousand kilometers which i was actually quite shocked at but yeah so back to ceramic bearings Overrated for speed or what everybody's buying them for, massively underrated for longevity if they're made correctly. Um, but in that in that sphere, stainless steel is really good as well if you look after it. What what's what's the price point on cheap bearings, stainless steel bearings, ceramic bearings? Just in general. So this is wild, because it depends on bottom brackets to headsets to wheels. Wheel bearings is probably the best example. Generally speaking, a a cheap bearing is going to be about five pounds. You could get it. I'm just averaging out over different sizes. Yep. Stainless steel, uh, we sell the Enduro ones. They are about 15 pounds bearing. So it's yep. not massively more. And you'll get your money back fairly quickly on that. Um, and then up to ceramic, you're looking at about 80 to 100 pounds bearing. So for wheels, it's really expensive. So I, uh, it's a, the last place where you, I would suggest go stainless steel there. Um, for bottom brackets, you're looking from 50 quid for standard bottom bracket up to about 280 for ceramic and then it goes up there up to 400 pounds if it's ceramic speed right so yeah it's it's not a cheap thing i guess i guess it comes down to uh, as a consumer as a, as a person that rides a bike how, mm, how like how much riding do you do what conditions do you ride in and then you can make a decision on whether it's a good investment or not the main thing i'm trying to say is if you live somewhere dry it's overrated don't waste your money i guess the point of what you're actually making here is if you're looking for performance Look elsewhere. There's better places to spend yeah, your yeah, money. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> it's just a waste of money. Okay, so keep sending your suggestions to wildonespodcast at cademedia.co.uk and we might read yours out in the next show. Next up, we have... Fluff Up of the Week! We got loads of messages after last week's Glove affiliate link post where people were emailing us saying like, well done, Cade Media. The gloves are sold out. <laughs> and then very shortly after those emails started coming through, I got an email from Amazon saying that our affiliate link wasn't set up. So uh, <laughs> someone has, well, we've made absolutely nothing from it, unfortunately. Who's paying for this coffee then? Me. Courtesy of Fluff Up of the Week. Fluff up. <laughs> <laughs> now for more listeners takeover. So we have an email from Matt, which says, hey, Long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> good, good, very good. <laughs> a few times you guys have mentioned some of Shimano's suspicious business practices, and after the recent scrutiny of Crankgate, I was surprised you hadn't discussed the Daily Telegraph investigation that came out in December, which found that one of Shimano's suppliers was exploiting its workers and using modern slaves. It's interesting because while ethical sourcing of materials has certainly become a major selling point in other industries, clothing in particular comes to mind, I'm guessing not cycling clothing and more specifically to like mass market brands, yeah. uh, cycling manufacturing amongst 
group sets, frames, and even clothing is pretty opaque. Curious to hear all of your thoughts and whether learning this would give you pause about buying Shimano, aside from SRAM Vangelist Nick, <laughs> who would likely not buy it anyway. Love to listen to you all. You're the only thing that makes my turbos more tolerable in winter. Cheers, Matt. Uh, first of all, thank you, Matt, for listening. You are a legend. Love you. Can I just say one thing before we carry on with this segment? Uh, yeah. I've got Shimano on both my mountain bikes. So I do like the Shimano mountain bike group sets. I haven't actually tried. Well, I've got the SRAM on gravel, but yeah, Shimano isn't all bad. Well, now you're going to have to give them up because they're cancelled. This story. <laughs> uh, so we missed this at the time, but let's talk about it now. So firstly, let's go over some of the details of that investigation by The Telegraph. It all centers around Kwangli Industry, or KLI for short, a Malaysian factory which was a supplier for Shimano. They have been accused of exploiting migrant workers from Nepal. Staff at the factory say that they've been subject to physical abuse and threats, unlawful salary cuts and recruitment fees and unpaid suspension. Due to the salary deductions, those workers earned less than the Malaysian monthly minimum wage. The Telegraph article also explains how Malaysia's labour sector has a history of importing migrants on cheap wages to work in its factories. The article says... These workers are recruited from the world's poorest countries and promised employment in well-paid jobs. The workers are often charged expensive recruitment fees to cover things like medical screenings, flight tickets, service charges, etc. And some say they used high interest loans to pay these fees. But when they get to Malaysia, they're often put to work in positions that pay less than minimum wage. They also have their passports taken off them, meaning they can't leave. Those trapped in this situation, known as debt bondage, carry on working in an attempt to pay off the debts. The phenomenon was apparently rife in Malaysia's rubber glove industry during the pandemic. KLI denied the allegations and Shimano said they were investigating the matter. Yeah, it's an interesting one, this. I've definitely heard about similar things happening in Eastern European factories too, particularly Turkey, with migrants coming into the EU. I think that some big organizations have policies about things like this but ultimately if they're employing third party companies they i guess rely on too much faith in my opinion i think they rely yeah. on too much faith that that company is doing what they say they were doing if if i had an unbelievably huge organization that worked with multiple factories I would want, like, it, it doesn't cost much for someone like Shimano to have one or two members of permanent staff that are solely responsible for Vetting. going through these factories, visiting, doing spot checks, like making sure that everything is as it's meant to be. Like that, I, in my opinion, they should be doing that stuff. And a lot of businesses do have that. I don't know whether Shimano does. We reached out to Shimano directly to give them a right of reply, which is something that we're obligated to do when reporting on allegations like this. So they said the allegations stand against Shimano's beliefs and their vendor code of conduct. They told us that in 2022, they had KLI and their other suppliers sign a new vendor code of conduct agreement, which promised that they would comply with fair work and conditions including no forced labour and fair and legal wages they said we have demanded that KLI take immediate action to thoroughly investigate and address this we've been clear with them that fair treatment of migrant workers is essential and that any sub abuse in our supply chain will not be tolerated and that we expect to be kept updated they've also launched their own investigation and said they'll take appropriate action as soon as possible you're totally right though it, when when you get to a size where your business is, you're never going to be using one source or factory. You're going to have multiple factories for different ranges. And I think a lot of this was done, this factory, the problem was through recruiters. So KLI was paying recruitment companies to source their workers. And a lot of this actually had to do with the pandemic as well, because they had to recruit more labor. Um, so it's, it's almost, it's going right down the chain Shimano are employing KLI, KLI are, are employing recruiters and recruiters are recruiting workers. Mm -hmm. So it's almost, you can see where things fall through the cracks, but you can also see where you can get away with responsibility for those things as well. Yeah, and, and I guess at, at no point are we suge suggesting that anyone knew. was new or was actually, you know, take, turning a blind eye, but... 
I don't think that that whether they were looking or not looking or aware or not where, I don't think that means that they are not responsible. They are responsible for knowing their supply chain. 100%. And that the people that are working in those f- factories are working in appropriate conditions and being paid fairly. Well, in Shimano's defense, I don't I mean, obviously they've not, well, I'm saying obviously, but I, I, I'm going to assume and give them the benefit of the doubt that they're not happy with this. Yeah. Um, and they didn't know about it. It's not like they knew this was happening and just carried on. And if they knew, it wouldn't be as an organization, it would be a couple of bad apples in there. I mean, this will be happening. That doesn't make a it lot okay, of big though. I'm not saying it's okay, but as long as they, I'm more interested in, do they act on it? That's that's the main thing. Yeah. Kind of like, how do they fix the problem, if that makes sense? And somebody needs to go do a follow-up. If in a few months' time, another story comes out that is still happening over there and Shimano is still using it, and then I would say yes. 100%. Um, I would definitely agree with you, Jimmy, that I do not think a code of conduct is enough. No. I think what you have to do is employ people to actively be s- supply chain managers, ultimately, overseers. It, not for, you know, if you're employing, if, if it's someone from their own company, the KLI or whatever, that is an overseer, that's they're not acting in the interests of Shimano. If it was my business, I would want people, a team of people, depending on how big your supply chain is, to be overseeing that. I, th- I think there should be uh, rules that say that if a uh, business is, revenue is over a certain threshold they have to know that every single step of their manufacturing is legit i agree and i think what would help that if there was independent bodies monitoring that and if there were heavy fines for breaches Mm -hmm. whether it was third party or not i think there has to be accountability with the original i guess part of the challenge then though becomes um how do you enforce that globally? Yeah, no, totally. It, and it, and that, that's where it all then starts to fall down again, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that, that's what it comes down to, isn't it? As a consumer, we really don't know the supply chains in any detail of anything. And I think just knowing where something is made in terms of country doesn't actually tell you that much either. No, absolutely. Well, it's not, not. in that, because like you said, you get some frame sets would be made somewhere and other frame sets from the same company in the production line would be... Far East, some things like forks, a lot of, I mean, most bike manufacturers don't make their own forks. So they'll be buying that in from somewhere else. It's, it's a bit of a, it is a difficult thing, but I, I just say, we well, wouldn't rely too much on where it was made. It's just, do you like the bike? Does it ride nice? Is it good quality? Totally. And I think companies me? generally, and this is not just cycling, but definitely applies to cycling. Companies get away with not divulging much because no one else is. Mm-hmm. And it's almost... In a way, it's almost like what we were talking about earlier about the lifetime warranty is like an extra thing they add on to appeal to consumers. I imagine if there were brands that started revealing more about their supply chains, then it would make them look more appealing. I definitely do think there's an appetite for people to be more sustainable and more ethical in their buying. I think the reason they wouldn't in the cycling industry is there is such a humongous anti-Far East movement in, in just people mm. and practically everything in cycling and a lot of the stuff in the world is manufactured in the, in the Far East. So I think the, the reason that brands wouldn't do that is you would actually, what they would act, ultimately be saying is 99% of everything you buy from us is manufactured in the Far East. And for some people, that means they would stop buying it, even though they would then go to a different brand where they would be buying stuff from the Far East and ha- are already buying stuff from the Far East. And using their telephones that are made in the Far East and watching this. Yeah, let, let's summarise this then. I think, <laughs> would it make you think twice about buying from Shimano? Possibly, but I think until you know more about the manufacturing processes of anywhere else, any competitors, then, yeah, I mean, you can't you can't just assume everyone's bad because they're not telling you anything. But as a consumer, generally, I would like to know more about everything. Yeah. I hope they sort this out. Um, and I hope they actually present some findings of their investigation and it would be nice to see more yeah. about so, supply chains generally. What I am starting to feel, I was actually talking about to Nick about this earlier and we've spoken about uh, these kind of weird little projects I have in my head every now and again. I am starting to have a bigger desire to look at like small independent local businesses. So say for example, uh, I need new chain rings. I could 
get something made by Hope Tech, for example, which are, you know, where are they? In Yorkshire or Leeds or something like that. Peak District. Peak District. So they're literally manufacturing them in the Peak District. I could walk into the factory if I wanted to. In the Hope Valley, actually. And then, and then, well, that makes sense now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I could literally walk into their factory and buy one of their chain rings. So I know exactly. I could probably speak to the person that's machined it. So, like, there are ways that I can buy stuff. And that isn't, again, that's not, again, being, like, anti-foreign. That's just going on. Well, I know, I can literally see with my eyes the supply chain or what's happening with that that product. So I, I think I'm going to spend more time considering the stuff that I buy in future and try and buy the, stuff The metal closer. has come from somewhere, though. Yeah, that's true. The slavery for me is a big no-no. Anything with the slavery, I'm, like, massively against. But then talking about Far East, some Far East produced products are better than anywhere else. So yeah. I use Zip as an example. I personally feel that Zip's quality has improved massively since they've moved the wheel manufacturing from America to the Far East. I don't think you can factory. assume just because stuff's made in the Far East that it's... Better or worse. Better or worse in terms of labor practices. And also, as I said, there was a massive investigation on places in Eastern Europe that were employing mig migrant workers. So it's just because something says it's made in Europe doesn't mean it's any better as well. Mm -hmm. We really can't know, can we? That's all for us from this week. That is Nick's last show, as Francis will be back next week. So thank you very much, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Um, I hope, well, it seems like you've been less offensive than we were expecting you to be, and everyone now loves you, which is also a surprise. Which I'm going to have to reverse all the way back again. <laughs> So thank you to all the listeners and for your continued support. Keep sending your emails to wildonespodcast at cademedia.co.uk. We love you and we love to read them. And we love you. <laughs> it doesn't even say we love you on the <laughs> no, sheet. No, it doesn't. I just wanted to say it, okay? Uh, please drop us a like if you're listening. Leave us a five-star review. Uh, no other reviews, please. Just five-star ones. Thank you. And we'll see you next week. And Jimmy loves you. I love you. Love you, bye. Bye, Nick. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>